Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 2B, and we're going to build on our discussion of DNA replication errors in Lecture 2A to talk about mutation rates, um, how often mutations arise and why, and about the consequences of mutations and introduce ideas about their evolutionary history. As we said in the previous lecture, new mutations arise rarely in part because DNA polymerase is very accurate. So we'll start with just, we're going to extrapolate, think about mutation rates before we were thinking about error rates in DNA replication. So here's a number. In humans, from parents to child, there are about 1 to 2 times 10 to the 8th new mutations. But what I've done here is I've left off the units. So what do you think the units are here? 1 to 2 times 10 to the minus 8th new mutations per what? Per genome? Per gene? Per base pair? In fact, it's new mutations per base pair. This is 10 to the minus 8th is a very small number. We have many, many base pairs in our DNA. But this isn't a complete thinking of per what. This is per amount of DNA, but we also need to ask per what sort of time unit? Per year? Per generation? Per cell division, which is effectively a DNA replication? And the answer is it's 1 or 2 times 10 to the 8th new mutations per base pair per generation. Now, we can reconcile this with the numbers that we talked about in the previous lecture in that we said there are about 10 to the minus 9th remaining errors after mismatch repair and um, DNA proofreading have done their best to eliminate the mistakes that DNA polymerase makes. So there's about 10 to the minus 9th errors per base pair, per cell division, we'll say, which is the same as a DNA replication cell division. That's a smaller number than this number. And the reason is we're now considering not a single cell division, but all the cell divisions between the fusion of eggs and sperm and the production of the next generation's egg or sperm by the adult. And that's a fairly large number of cell divisions, um, more than 20 for sure. Now, new mutations arise very rarely, we just said. In fact, very, very, very rarely. A very accurate process, provided the DNA that DNA polymerase is using is not damaged, as long as it's structurally normal DNA. And this is accomplished by combination of proofreading by DNA polymerase and mismatch repair. But DNA also can get damaged, and we'll talk more about this later. Cells have evolved ways to repair DNA damage because otherwise this DNA damage would cause mutations. And the two processes, which we're not going to talk about at all, I just want to give you the names of them, are called excision repair, which cuts out damage, and recombination repair, which patches damage. Now, how many new mutations do we get? We said 1 to 2 times 10 to the minus 8th per base pair per generation. What does that mean practically? We don't think in terms of base pairs. That's about somewhere around 100 new mutations per diploid genome. And we can do the arithmetic to see that that is about what we get. That means that on average, each new baby has approximately one, sometimes none, sometimes one, sometimes two, new mutations, mutations that were not present in their parents, that changes an amino acid in a protein. So this means that we're constantly generating new genetic differences. Now, one more piece of information, which I'm just going to raise it here and come back to it in Lecture 2H. And that's that most of these new point mutations 
arise in the father, in the production of gametes by the father, not in the production of gametes by the mother. And we'll talk about why later. Now let's think about the consequences of these mutations. And the most important point to know about mutations is that most mutations have consequences that are either neutral or harmful. Mutations that are beneficial are very rare. So why is this the case? Well, first, most mutations are neutral because they occur in places in the genome where they don't make any difference to gene function. We'll talk quite a bit more about this in Lecture 2C. Most of the rest are harmful. Very few new mutations are beneficial. And that's because living systems, the genetic DNA sequences that specify all the properties of living systems are very well adapted. They're the product of billions of years of natural selection for better and better function. And that means that if you make any random change, and that's what a mutation is, it's a random change, the odds that this change makes the system function better are very, very small. In the same way that a random little change to the innards of your computer is very, very unlikely to make it function better. So we can take this understanding of the functional consequences of mutations and apply that to thinking about the genetic differences that we see. Fundamentally, all of the genetic differences that we see, all of the differences, for instance, that we talked about in module one, they all started out as new mutations with the same spectrum of neutral, harmful, and beneficial, as I just described. Natural selection then acts as a filter. It eliminates the bulk of new mutations that are harmful, well, and it allows to persist all the new mutations that are neutral and increases the frequency of any new mutations that are substantially beneficial. Those new mutations, the beneficial ones, are a very small fraction. Almost all of what we see as natural genetic variation is neutral mutations that have cum accumulated over evolutionary time. So we've talked about the rarity of new mutations. We did some arithmetic. Um, and remember that they're extremely rare in the context of um, per base pair. But when we extend that to think about whole genome, our genomes are so large that we inherit new mutations with every generation. Almost all of these new mutations are neutral or harmful. The neutral ones tend to persist. The harmful ones tend to be eliminated by natural selection. Um, more slowly if they're masked by the presence of a good copy of a gene, which is something we'll talk about in Module 3. Neutral mutations in particular accumulate over evolutionary time, and it's these neutral mutations that are largely responsible for the many DNA sequence differences that we find between different people. And then a small subset of these neutral mutations that cause phenotypic differences that we see are responsible for the phenotypic differences that we see between different people. Coming up next, we're going to think in more detail about why most mutations are harmless. I hope to see you there.